There we go. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Erica Wright, and I'm an educator at the Center for Astrophysics, uh, where I spend a lot of my time encouraging young people to explore the uni universe through the creativity of astrophotography. So I'm particularly excited to be here with you to chat about the universe and the inspiration that, for creativity that many of us find in its beauty. Uh, to give everybody a sense of what we're going to be doing today, what to expect, um, we're gonna start off with a short panel discussion, but move relatively quickly into a more informal discussion, inviting all of you to participate with us today. Um, as I mentioned previously, I'm gonna be recording the panel discussion, but I'll be stopping the recording uh, before, so when we open it up to the wider audience and conversation. If you don't want your face recorded, please just turn off your camera until that open discussion. All right, so now that we have the logistics out of the way, um, we're gonna start with a brief kind of round robin of introductions and I'm gonna ask our panelists to give us just a little introduction to who they are, what they do at the CFA, um, and a short description of how they get creative with the universe. Uh, does anybody wanna volunteer to go first? I guess I'll go. Um, hi guys, uh, my name is Jordan Eagle. Uh, I'm a pre-doctoral fellow here at the Center for Astrophysics and um, I've been here for about a, a year. I work on pulsar wind nebulae, which are uh, descendants of core collapse supernova explosions. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at characterizing them uh, mainly in the gamma ray regime. Um, and I work with Dr. Daniel Castro. My cosmic creation is uh, my personal slash professional uh, blog uh, website, uh, jordaneleagle.com, um, where I basically try to um, explain my research and what I do in a really general way, um, just in an effort to reach as many people as possible with what I'm doing, as, as well as um, tips and tricks on how to survive graduate school. Um, I haven't done a tip in, in quite a while, though. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Claire, do you want to go next? Sure. My name is Claire. I'm in my second year as a graduate student at the CFA. I study cosmology, which is how the universe evolves on really large scales. So I'm helping with a survey that is measuring tens of billions of galaxies and mapping them out. So we're basically creating a very complete map of the nearby universe to see how it's changing. My uh, sort of creative projects usually involve baking. So I do a lot of different types of baking, some more related to science than others. Um, I think the my, my favorite ones are, are baking things for other grad students. So I'll try to do something that's related to uh, their research or their interests. It's, it, it's purely decorating, yeah. <laughs> Could you give us an example of something interesting that you've baked? Yeah, so um, it's been hard to baking for people during the pandemic, but over Christmas, I baked a lot of cookies and drove them around to grad students who were still in the area. And I made uh, cookies that had plots on them uh, that were plots from some of their, their papers. So that was fun to, to find. Very cool. Um, all right, uh, Nico, would you like to go next? Sure, thanks. So my name is Nico Carver. I'm uh, one of the librarians at the Center for Astrophysics. And one of the projects that I get to work on is preserving the early history of the Harvard College Observatory, where astrophotography was first a big deal in professional astronomy, because early on, um, professional astronomers would just look at the night sky, like through an eyepiece and a big telescope. And then it was at the Harvard College Observatory where they first started photographing the night sky on these big glass plates. And we still have the biggest collection of glass plates in the world. And um, it was at this time they started studying what was on these glass plates. And there was um, a group of women called the Harvard Computers who became very important because they made all of these amazing discoveries of what they were seeing on these glass plates. So um, one of my projects is I get to look at their journals and help preserve them and transcribe them so that future generations can understand their work and how important they are to sort of the history of astronomy. 
Um, and this connects to my creative uh, cosmic creation, which is astrophotography. Um, so this picture behind me of the Orion Nebula is an example of a photograph I took of the night sky. And it's a really fun hobby. Um, I think that it's, it's um, really starting to take off because with uh, digital cameras, like a, just like a normal DSLR like this, we can uh, gather so much. And, and, and there's, there's really all kinds of interesting ways to get started, even just with like a DSLR on a tripod, you can take pictures of uh, far off nebulae and galaxies. Very cool. Thank you, Nico. And I'll actually, at the end of our discussion, be sharing another way that you all can get interested and excited about um, astrophotography using a resource that we have at the Center for our Astrophysics called Micro Observatory. So I'll share with you a little challenge we have going on um, as part of Cambridge Science Festival. Um, all right, so I think we also have with us uh, Victoria. Yeah, so um, I'm Victoria Di Tommaso, like Claire, I'm also a second year PhD student at the CFA. I study exoplanets, which are planets outside of our solar system. In particular, I look at measurements of stars and look for an effect of a wobble that's caused if there's a star with an exoplanet around it, those two bodies are orbiting one center of mass. So we're able to see this little tiny wobble in that star, and that's an indicator that there's a planet around that star. Um, my cosmic creation is sort of generally astro fashion, and um, I submitted a few pictures of some older nail art that I uh, have done that's been space inspired. Um, and something for me that I really like about astro fashion is that I almost feel like it's it's um, an indicator that I'm sort of part of the club. <laughs> um, I think that it gets a reaction both from people that are astronomers and people that aren't astronomers, and it can be a really accessible way to start a conversation both with the public and also with people in the field, even people that are much more senior, it's usually something fun to kind of talk about. Plus I think it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, very cool. Well, we have an incredible breadth of creativity uh, and interest in our panel. So thank you all for being here with us. Um, does anybody wanna share with us kind of a little bit more deeply about what inspires you to get creative kind of what started, what you got started with, why you do this a little more deeply? I can go. So um, I actually uh, am now at the CFA through my cosmic creation because um, I wasn't someone who was interested in astronomy at a young age. I was actually interested in photography. And then that led me eventually into astrophotography, which is sort of the most nerdy technical kind of photography because it just requires a lot of planning and sort of uh, technical know-how to make sure everything works and you get nice round stars. And so um, it, it, was a, it was a sort of a long journey in astrophotography, but I got so interested in it that I wanted to sort of converge my professional life with astronomy. And so I was looking specifically for astronomy librarian jobs. And when one opened up at the CFA, um, I just got so excited because I, I, I love the night sky now, I love astronomy. And so being able to work uh, with professional astronomers and, and be there every day was, was a really cool opportunity for me. Really interesting. I have a question for Nico, if that's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I liked how you made the comparison to like the really early days of the CFA and images on glass plates. Have you made comparisons between you know, like some some glass plate pictures of the Rhine Nebula and more modern photography that you've done. I think it'd just be, I don't know, it'd be cool to see a gallery that, that compares them. I have, yeah. And one project I really want to do is recreate the Horsehead Nebula discovery plate that where Wilhelmina Fleming discovered the Horsehead Nebula um, with a modern camera. Um, the the what's really interesting is that they would back then they would take one single long exposure onto the glass plate and it would go pretty deep and it, it's, it's actually like a really impressive photograph in terms of how deep it goes with the, the very small stars that it's capturing because they were using really big telescopes um, but today of course we can go with like amateur astrophotography I can capture a lot more through what's called stacking and it's basically taking many many digital exposures together and and sort of averaging them all together and so 
Um, but it would be, I think it'd be really fun. I think that the other thing that's, that's weird is that no one, um, we've never gotten like a digital sensor. I mean, maybe now the really professional observatories, but in the amateur world, we don't have digital sensors that are like eight by 10 inches, which is what these glass plates were. Our digital sensors are much, much smaller. So for me to like recreate what they were doing, I'd have to use a much, much wider camera lens. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something I really am interested in and, and want to try out is like looking and comparing um, a picture from taken in like 1885 to a picture taken in 2021. Actually, um, we actually in the education department work with uh, some art educators who love our astrophotography. And one has actually been talking about developing an exhibit all around that concept, Claire, of kind of comparing some of these historical images on the glass plates with modern astrophotography. So <laughs> perfectly apt. Do, do any of you know if anyone is doing glass plate photography today? Like just for fun? I know it's not practical. Yes, but. yeah, there's, there, they, you can still buy the dry plates um, from a guy in Vermont uh, who makes them <laughs> by hand. And like, he like puts the emulsion right onto them. And yeah, there are a few people in the world still doing astrophotography on glass plates as amateurs. I don't know, I don't think that it would ever, it's, it's been used professionally since like the 1990s when, when the CCD cameras got really good. That is so cool. Well, we actually have another astrophotographer who has joined us, um, Rutu. We had everybody at the start introduce themselves, um, just a little bit who they are, what you do at the CFA and what your creativity, your creative outputs are. Would you like to join in the conversation? Hi, thank you. Sorry, I had to join a little late, everybody. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Rutu. Um, at the CFA, I am an astrophysicist and science communicator. So I, as an astrophysicist, I have my own research, which was like cosmology and galaxy clusters, but also looking at like random X-ray sources at this point. Um, but the like bigger chunk of my work is uh, with NASA's universe of learning. So it's, um, taking all of NASA's missions and putting them together to do multi-wavelength outreach as a whole. So not just about visible light or x-rays or ultraviolet, just bringing everything together uh, and uh, talking to the public about how we look at the skies. Um, and you know, this, this varies, like I, I get to talk to little kids, which is wonderful. I get to talk to adults, so it's a whole spectrum. Um, and I, um, well, the stars have, the skies have inspired me for forever, really. Um, and I love words, as you might be able to see behind me. Um, I love to read, uh, always love to write poetry. Um, and my biggest inspiration has always been the natural world around me. Uh, it used to be like flowers and dandelions and, you know, it still is by the way, but um, as I learned more about space, I also started writing more about the wonders that are out there. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, there's poetry and, you know, some of it is like, you know, not like, you know, ethereal or like really celebrating the beauty out there. And some of it is just silly because, you know, I found a song and decided that it could be parodied. Um, so it, 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 there's a spectrum. And I also love to take photos. Again, started out taking photos of like the best close up I could get of a flower or, you know, little bumblebee sitting on a thing. But after I uh, had the chance to go up into mountains to use like our great big telescopes um, and see the beautiful sky, I also started taking photos of the night sky, um, both to just trying to capture what I was seeing, but also time lapse. I love doing star trail photos. So, yeah. Wonderful. Hello. Thanks so much, Rutu. That's fantastic. Um, so we're starting to kind of have some conversations and as Claire jumped in, I do want all of you to ask your own follow-up questions. I think there's a lot of creativity in this space, so I want to encourage that um, amongst our panelists. And then, like I said, in probably just a few minutes, we'll open it up to our guests as well. Um, but I want to have some of this recorded uh, to share with our audience uh, going forward. Um, so 
I have a couple more questions, but do any of our panels have anything that they want to ask each other or want to share before I jump into some questions? I had a I had a question for Clara actually. Um, I've been staring at your beautiful baked goods uh, ever since I found out about them from that like CFA article uh, a few weeks ago. Um, do you have like, is it, do you, how do you decide what you're going to do? Is it like by occasion? Like I know I write some poems by occasion, like, oh, we had a huge discovery. I'm going to write it for that. Um, or is it like, you just feel like it and uh, like, where, where do you get inspiration for the particular things that you make? Uh, yeah, so I decide when to do things mostly when I have time and if I can plan ahead enough, I will time it to some event. Like I, I did sourdough that looked like the, um, Ingenuity Rover inside, oh, oops, yeah, inside, um, when it landed. And, uh, I also like, I, one thing that really helped me like have a really consistent, like inspiration schedule was I was making birthday cakes for all the grad students in our year and so whenever one of them had a birthday I was like okay time to figure something out for them actually Victoria is one of the only ones that I haven't done it for yet because of the, the pandemic um yeah I don't know I spend a lot of time on on Instagram and YouTube just watching you know not not not, not trash but um <laughs> just pretty like boring cake decorate do videos and stuff so I I will often see a really cool baking idea that I might want to try and then I might think about how I could make it uh, science related or come up with a theme for it. There. I have a question for Jordan. How, how did you decide to start a blog like when there's kind of a wide variety of ways to put stuff out on the internet these days? Like what, what made you make that decision in particular? Yeah, so uh, I, I've always uh, very much valued outreach um, and like, you know, trying to get my research out there in a way that anybody can understand. Um, so I've always, I've always um, participated in a, you know, a range of activities that, that would do that. Um, but I think it was right around the time when I got this fellowship and was preparing to move here. And I think I remember seeing, I think it was Yvette Sendez. Like I noticed that she had this really amazing personal website and it was like showcasing all of her like articles that she's written for. And I was like, I need to do that. Not only because um, it's it's popular for people in our fields to, to kind of showcase like their publications and things like that. Um, but I also was interested in, in, um, in using a personal website to um, try and discuss my research very generally as a way at, um, as a way of to do outreach. And um, it actually stuck. Like I do genuinely like still keep up with it. I mean, it's been a while since I've done a blog post, but um, that's only because I've had to go through this whole thing of switching the servers. That's been a whole thing and then losing some formatting. So, and it's just me running a website, but you know, I definitely um, just, I just love sharing my enthusiasm and, and hope that, you know, like anti-vaxxers, flat earthers and stuff like that just kind of start to engage a little bit more and just that's kind of the end goal is just community engagement for everyone like I have a question for Victoria um I mean I've I've got to see you in person a lot so I can attest to your uh, fashion skills do you typically I don't know how to say this. Do you um, like specifically seek out things that are fashion pieces that are like, look like they're astronomy themed? Do you find ones that might not directly be astronomy themed? And then like, I don't know, like a black shirt with white dots. Um, and then also, have you ever designed your own clothes or thought about it? Okay, so I I think that there's been kind of an evolution um, based on how how much I had in my wardrobe that was spacey. Um, so in the beginning, when I was an undergrad, one of my first research advisors um, was one of the founders of Star Torialist, with it, which is an astro-themed fashion and lifestyle blog turned business. 
And um, kind of at the start, I was just like, that's cool. I want some of that. And so um, sort of gathered a lot of things fairly quickly and very, fairly purposefully, where I think now everyone in my life just kind of knows that I wear a lot of stuff with stars on it. So like this shirt with stars on it, like my mom gave it to me for Christmas. Like I think a lot of my stuff nowadays is just that's what people know to get me um, for presents. Um, what was your second question? Oh, like do you or have you ever thought about designing your own clothes? I I have not. I have some pieces. So also this necklace. Well, my mom makes jewelry. So although this is very simple, it's something that like I asked her to like get this particular charm and put it on this particular chain. So I have some stuff like that, but not like crafted anything out of clay, kind of not not at that level. But it does sound like you used to make your own nail design, right? Your own nail art. Yeah, that's true. Um, largely inspired by Pinterest. Um, and that's something else I kind of, I mean, those pictures are, are pretty old and they, I mean, I don't think that they like look professional or anything, but it, it's sort of to show you don't need to be so amazing. Like, I mean, everything that Claire makes is immaculate and just really professional grade <laughs> beauty, um, which of course is amazing and we all appreciate it. But if anyone is interested in getting started and doing things that are spacey, you don't have to be the most uber talented be able to create the most beautiful outcome. It's still fun. It still gets the point across. Um, oh, also to, I just remember, Claire, you had mentioned, like, do I find things that are sort of like space adjacent and then uh, kind of move them that way? I do have one kind of paint splatter. I think it's advertised as a paint splatter dress, but whenever I wear it, everyone's like, oh, it's galaxies. It's close enough, yeah. <laughs> I guess context matters. Um, so obviously you all kind of have followings, people that are really inspired by what you do, uh, conversations you've had with others where they're just amazed at what you do. Why do you think so many people connect to the creative pieces, um, or surrounding the universe or the cosmos? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my, my thought is that I think that people have a very natural draw to space and often kind of like an innate curiosity about the sky and space and where we come from and kind of all the big questions that are sort of probed through astronomy. And I think that the creative side of it and the artistic creations are an accessible way for people to relate to space, where the science side often I don't know, it can be a lot of physics, it can be a lot of math, a lot of things that are intimidating for a lot of people, but things like big goods or fashion or photos are, are digestible and people can engage with them, I think. I think uh, deep sky astrophotography, like this sort of makes it real for people because it's not something that you can just like go out and see with your naked eye. But then when you take a photograph of it and you see like the colors of a nebula or another galaxy on your DSLR, all of a sudden it's like, wow, that's really out there um, and I'm capturing it. So I think that sort of, it's just, it's there's sort of a disconnect until you can really sort of feel like, oh yeah, this is really out there um, because we're just so creatures of like our normal senses uh, that a lot of times you don't you don't think about space until you really connect with it. I I agree. Um, well, I agree with what both of you said, um, but I was initially also thinking along the lines of what Victoria said, um, that it just makes something that people think is super esoteric accessible. Um, and also, you know, many people think that like, oh man, this is like deep science and like requires a lot of math and it's, you know, there are a lot of insecurities I've seen where people are like, oh, I, I won't be able to get that. But when you put it into something that people are much more comfortable with, like, um, you know, desserts or clothes or, you know, poetry, maybe, um, or writing photos, you know, 
all of this stuff, it's, there's been this like dichotomy of like, oh, there is science and like mathy stuff. And then there's like humanities and artsy stuff. But, and I, I know many people who avoid science because they're like, no, I, I, I'm more of an artsy person and I can't, and I can't like, I can't do the math. I can't, I won't get it. But then this, this shows them that like, they're not separate, you know, we can, we can do the artsy stuff and the humanities stuff with science and it's not that we're doing it with science is that like they're all sort of part of the same we're all trying to explore the universe around us in our own ways and um not just like in art as well you know an artist is exploring the universe around themselves and displaying it in their own way so it just yeah it, it brings it to people who otherwise think that they might not be able to engage with it so I have a little bit of a follow-up question on that um, that kind of goes back the other way. Um, I think there's a lot of young people that consider themselves scientists um, and therefore think they can't also be creative, right? Like that was my thought when I was younger, like, oh, I'm science and therefore I'm, I'm not artistic, although I create lots of crafts. I bake, although not <laughs> to the beauty of Claire's <laughs> um, really incredible creation. But um, it took me a long time to realize that I could be both. Uh, why do you think so many people think you can't, that scientists aren't creative or can't be creative or shouldn't be creative? I think like, I think that stems a lot from, uh, I mean, it's just the way society talks about it. You know, you have like left-brained people and right-brained people and, you know, oh, you're, um, even in school you know we have all the like stereotypical like groups of people like oh you're the nerds and you know you're the artists and I mean yes it's stereotypical but like people do talk about it and in school you sort of feel sometimes slotted into like one of those groups and I think in our culture there culture there is a lot of like oh man there, there's a separation you know you can't do both um but honestly like most scientists I know like do something I mean sorry I was gonna say something else I was gonna say most scientists I know do like some form of art or some form of you know either fine or visual art but like every scientist you know has a dimension to themselves other than science so it's it's that stereotype that a scientist is the lone <laughs> person on a mountaintop staring at the skies, doing their math, thinking of their, I don't know, esoteric, like, ooh, this is the cosmos and not doing anything else, which is, which is false. Yeah, I think culture plays a big part. And you also see it in media a lot too, just like this infallible genius who their, their only personality is that they can like solve a math equation instantly. Like, no, none of the really like respected people here are are like that. I mean, there are people who can do that, but you don't become a really great scientist because you can, you know, you under you can solve math quickly. Um, but it's often because uh, I think, especially the like leaders in the field, are leaders because they came up with creative ways to do things. So I think it's important to say that you know scientists can also be creative, not just in their hobbies, but in their science as well. And in fact, it's like very beneficial. The people who who win awards are ones who come up with a new creative way to look at something or study something. Um, and I think it's really easy to not see that if you're not in the field. That's a fantastic point. All right, I'm gonna ask one last formal question and then, um, then I'll stop the recording and our guests can join us and we can kind of get a little more casual. Um, uh, Victoria already kind of started stepping into this, but I, I want to ask you all um, how others might get involved in starting creative exercises like the ones that you do. What are your suggestions? Well, um, Erica, you already mentioned one, which is the micro observatory challenge. So that um, astrophotography can be done um, remotely and the micro observatory is a great way to do it um, that way. But you can also get started with it yourself in person. Um, so 
if you have any kind of camera, um, you can go start taking pictures of the night sky. Uh, Rutu mentioned star trails, which is a great way to, to start because you can basically just let your camera shutter open for a long time and see the rotation of the earth and how the stars are moving across the sky. So, uh, and, and moon of course is another good one to start uh, photographing. Um, so for anybody who might be specifically interested in blogging, it's actually really easy to do. Um, there's tons of free like platforms that help you make a very easy blog template. Um, I actually started on Weebly.com, which is actually where I just recently moved from to over to WordPress, which is um, not as user friendly. So I would probably suggest Weebly if you're, you know, a big beginner. Um, and it's absolutely free to do. And, and I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty decent. So yeah, I mean, if you, if you guys are interested in blogging, but I think like in general, if, if there's a hobby that you really enjoy, um, I'm sure there's some type of twist that you can put into it that, that um, can incorporate some of your other interests as well. So yeah. There are a lot of resources online for how to get started with baking. I My main thing is, is I like decorating. And so for decorating, I, I highly recommend if you're interested watching videos. That's I think the best way to get a sense for how things are done. All those videos though, will show examples of decorating something very generic. They, they wanna make a, a style or a theme that will appeal to the most amount of people possible. So it might be like, you know, flowers or something, which are nice, but uh, I encourage if you're interested, learn how to decorate and then uh, try to make it make it your own. Think of something else you're you're interested, maybe maybe science and figure out how to how to bake it. Um, if uh, well, people want to write poetry um, or write anything, I guess, like uh, creative writing. Um, I guess one of the hardest things about writing and maybe, I don't know, Jordan, if you agree, is like actually getting started. And then once, so once you sit down and start putting words, like they don't have to be perfect, just put down words. And sometimes in retrospect, those words will feel a lot nicer than they felt as you were like, as you're putting them out there. Um, and there's always editing possibilities. And sometimes you'll find that, oh, wait, you thought that wasn't great, but now you don't want to edit it because it actually works really nicely. And the thing with the thing with poetry is that, you know, a lot of people think, okay, poetry has to rhyme. It has to have a strict meter. It Poetry actually doesn't have that many rules. Um, if you want it to rhyme, it can. If you want it to have a strict meter, it can. Um, I think everybody has, I feel like there are different ideas about what the difference is between poetry and actual prose. And I think for me, it's that like poetry sort of follows thoughts and emotions and doesn't necessarily need to con like conform to grammar. Um, a lot of it is like loose phrases and things that can be like a stream of consciousness, sort of how I'm talking right now. Apparently I'm not talking in complete senses, um, but you're putting, it's sort of what you're feeling into words or what you're imagining. And it doesn't necessarily have to be properly formatted, properly grammared. On the other hand, if you're stuck for inspiration, sometimes picking a format really helps. Like I write a lot of my parodies because I'm like, I'm not sure what to write, but oh, hey, let me try to, parody this one poem or something or this one song and that gives me a structure that I can work around so that goes both ways but yeah just just start putting down the words that you're thinking and they'll turn into something Yeah, I kind of uh, mentioned already but as far as nail art um, or other inspiration I think Pinterest is really great and also spacey fashion is pretty in style uh, nowadays. So you can find a lot of stuff at Target, at H&M. Um, and I also know, I, I've heard a lot of complaints that a lot of more space fashion is marketed toward women. And although fashion and style has no gender, I think that things like face masks um, is kind of a fun, like very open gender neutral way of, of getting, you're buying a few new face masks anyway, one or two of them could be space themed. That's just a way to kind of dip your toe in. 
Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. This has been so exciting and a really interesting conversation and invite our guests to ask some of their questions as well.